welcome to Westbrook Online. I am Pastor Mont, and I am so thrilled to be able to welcome you to our services today. Uh, we really know that God has got some really special things uh, in store for you today, and I pray that as you tune your heart and tune your mind into uh, Christ, uh, He'll be able to do surprising things uh, for you. We're in a series of messages right now entitled, one at a time. And we're uh, preaching these messages uh, as we build up to Easter, and we're really excited about what that's going to be, and so we'll give you more information about Easter in the days to come. Uh, but we're in this series on one at a time, looking at exactly how Jesus impacted the world in the way that he did. You know, he didn't have a PhD. He didn't have a great Instagram following and all those kind of things. But what he did to make such an impact in the world is that he met people where they were one at a time. I want you to be with us every weekend as we build up to Easter and we know that God will really, really, really speak to all of us. Of course, if you're a part of our online family and our online congregation, one of the things that we always want you to do is do your best to stay connected to us. You can email us at info at westbrook.church. Let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know what's going on in your life. Let us know how you think that you might be able to get engaged and, and really grow as a disciple of Jesus. So you do your best to, to stay connected to us as we do our best to minister to you, even if you're part of our online uh, congregation. Now, before we leave today, we want to challenge you to, to take advantage of a couple opportunities to encounter God. These are the same kind of opportunities that we encounter God with in our live services. Number one, we would love for you to be a financial partner of this ministry. Uh, let us know uh, and let Christ know that you put your full faith and trust in Him by giving faithfully to Him through this ministry. And we know that God will use your gift to help impact this world uh, for Him. The second thing that I want to challenge you to do before you leave today is take a moment with a cup of juice and a piece of bread and remember Christ's sacrifice through a time of communion. Uh, we do that again in our live services as well, and we want you to do that before you end this service today. Now, we have lots of things that are happening in the life of our church. You can uh, follow our social media pages, and wherever you are in this world, we'd love for you to stay connected as you too are a part of Westbrook Church. Thank you so much for that. As we kick off into our service, I want to take just a moment and pray for God's blessing upon your life today and upon this service as well. Bow your heads if you don't mind. Father, thank you that we have this opportunity to be with your church. Even if it's on an online medium, God, we can be together because we know that you are with us. God, I pray that today, as we study your word, you will speak to our hearts. And God, as we stay connected with you and through this church, that God, you will enrich and bless all of us no matter where we are. Thank, thank you for opportunities to, to remember who you are and what you have done. Thank you for opportunities to put our faith and trust in you. And thank you for opportunities to share the joy and walk with each other as we journey through life. May you bless our time, bless this service. In Jesus we pray, amen and amen. Enjoy the service today. Keeper, 
Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I work you I worship you you are here healing every heart I worship you I worship you you are here turning lives around I worship you stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel that you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel that you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working You are way maker, miracle worker Promise keeper, light in the darkness My God, that is who you are 
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Good morning, Westbrook Online. My name is Jake. I'm the congregational pastor just down the road at our Crossroads Congregation in Joliet. Uh, But today I have the honor and privilege of being with you as we kick off this brand new series called One at a Time. This is our uh, series leading up to Easter. And what this series is all about is seeing people the way that Jesus sees people, because Jesus wants us to see people through that same lens. And the way that Jesus sees people is one at a time. And he wants us as his followers to to see others one at a time. And uh, as I was thinking about that concept of one at a time and seeing people one at a time, I I thought Jesus just encompassed encompasses this concept so well, and that's really what we're going to be diving into for this one at a time series, because as his followers, we want to do the same. Now, that got me thinking about uh, the magazine, Time. Uh, Every year, Time Magazine does uh, this issue with the most influential people. Now, most of the time, the people I have on my list and the people they have on their list uh, almost never match up because the most influential people in my life are vastly different than the people that Time Magazine puts on their most influential list. But a few years back, They didn't just do an annual issue of this. They did the most influential people in all of history. Now, this is where, for the most part, our list uh, have virtually nothing in common with one exception. And that exception is Jesus Christ. Uh, As a matter of fact, not only does Jesus Christ show up on their list of most influential people, uh, as a matter of fact, he was number one, the most influential person in all of human history, according to, to Time magazine. Now, this is something that we agree on, and the reason that I think that they have labeled him as the most influential person uh, of all time is because of the way that he interacted with people, because of the way that he saw people. He saw people one at a time. He saw them as individuals, and that's really what this series is all about. And that brings us to our big idea for today. Our big idea for today is this. We are called to slow down long enough and zoom in close enough to see people the way that Jesus does. He wants us to slow down long enough and zoom in close enough. And I think if we do this, we can really make a difference in people's lives. The problem, the problem with us, uh, not just myself and not just with you, this is a human problem. The problem with humanity is we wanna skip to the good part, right? Uh, And when we skip to the good part, we miss some steps along the way. And usually that can result in utter disappointment. It reminds me of a a time that I had as a kid. And maybe you've experienced this exact same thing or or something similar. Uh, As a kid, we would do field trips. And I'm I'm from the Joliet area. I'm from the Chicago land area. And if you're from the Chicago land area, uh, inevitably, at some point growing up, you probably took a field trip to the Sears Tower, right? Now, I don't care what they call it to me in my heart. It will always be the Sears Tower, right? Uh, we took a field trip to the Sears Tower. Uh, and I remember, I remember the, the tour guide at some point telling us, before we went up to the sky deck, telling us that, that you could see you could, all the different things you could see. And they said you could actually see 
uh, from the viewing tower, the, the spectacular views of four different states from the top of the Sears Tower. You could see Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And so me, as a little kid, I thought... I thought I was going to get up to the top of the Sears Tower and I thought I was going to see the entire shape of the state, kind of like you do uh, when you look at a map. Uh, so I got up to the top and I was utterly disappointed, uh, especially when I looked out and not only did I not see these states that they told me about, uh, but I really couldn't see nearly as far as I wanted or, or what I thought I was going to see. While it was a spectacular view, it wasn't until I slowed down long enough and I found something that helped me zoom in close enough that I really saw what they were talking about. Uh, and maybe you had this similar experience. I don't know if you've ever been up to the top of the Sears Tower or, or something like that and used one of these coin viewers. Have you ever seen one of these coin viewers? Uh, these things are incredible because when you're at the top of one of these uh, skyscrapers, you can see a lot, but this coin viewer, you drop your quarters in there and it allows you to zoom in. It's like a super powered pair of binoculars. And uh, when I was at the top of the Sears Tower and I finally used my quarters, I could then actually see all the states that they were telling me about. Uh, and the tour guide kind of helped us zoom in. They knew where to point it so you could see these different landmarks and so on and so forth. But I thought, what a powerful illustration that this provides for us. Because I think this is exactly how God wants us to operate. He wants us to be just like Jesus. He wants us to slow down long enough and zoom in close enough to see people one at a time just like Jesus did. Uh, I love that about Jesus because that's how he, he did ministry. Uh, if you look at the Gospels, the vast majority of the Gospels show Jesus doing ministry on the way. There's two phrases that pop up uh, all over the Gospels is on the way and one at a time. He's doing ministry on the way and he's doing ministry one on one with people. And the only way that that happens, the only way that... Jesus allows that to happen is the same way that we need to allow that to happen. The only way that happens is if we slow down long enough to see people one at a time. The vast majority of Jesus' ministry is all focused on one on one. There is times that he does ministry and he preaches sermons to crowds and crowds of people, but the majority of what is recorded in the Gospels are one-on-one -on -one interactions. Sometimes one is better than many. Uh, digital advertising experts estimate that we, as modern Americans, see on average uh, about 5,000 advertisements every single day, and it's all aimed at the same thing, more, 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 consume more, get more, spend more. The problem with more is that more is a moving target, and sometimes one is more important than many. One is more important than more. Sometimes it's important to zoom in close enough and slow down long enough to see the one just like Jesus did. And so if you have your Bibles, I would love if you'd open your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 15. We're gonna be looking at a story with, that Jesus tells, a, a parable that Jesus tells about seeing people one at a time. Uh, he tells this parable in Luke chapter 15. I'm gonna start reading in verse one. It says this, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. 
Now, if you underline in your Bible or you circle or highlight or whatever it is that you do, this might be one of those phrases. Or if you're using your uh, uh, NIV study Bible app, the, the version Bible app, if you just click it, it will highlight it. This is one of those phrases that you might want to highlight. It says, suppose one of you has 100 sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 persons who do not need to repent. Mm. Jesus tells this powerful story, and I think it illustrates the point that Jesus sees people one at a time. And that's exactly what he wants the Pharisees and the religious leaders to understand is that sometimes slowing down and zooming in requires us to see people one at a time because that's exactly what they were failing to do. They were totally overlooking people in their midst. It says that Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners. Now, those were two very specific groups of people. Now, the tax collectors were traitors. They were seen as cheaters. They were people who sold out their own kind to the Roman government. You see, the Roman government were ruling the Jewish people at this time. And so the tax collectors were fellow Jewish people who had sold out their own kind to make a profit off of them working for the Roman government. And so in their eyes, in the religious leader's eyes, these people were like the bottom of the barrel. These people were seen as like the scum of the earth. Tax collectors had their own separate category. And then this other phrase that he uses is sinners. Now he doesn't just mean any kind of sinner, any person who sins. This was a subcategory for them as well, just like uh, tax collectors were these separate category. When he says sinners, this was people who were these were people who were known to have a sinful lifestyle or people who made a living by sinning. This would be people like the town drunk or the town prostitute, uh, people who were known for their sinful lifestyle, or people who made a living from a sinful lifestyle. And these were the very people that Jesus was eating with. He was welcoming them, and he was eating with them. Eating with people was a sign of hospitality. In the Greek, it gives us this image of welcoming someone. The way that you would welcome a family member into your home who hasn't been there in a while. It's this, this image of a warm embrace. It's maybe the, the way that you hug an aunt or an uncle that you see at Thanksgiving dinner or, or Christmas dinner when you haven't seen them in a while. It's welcoming someone that you love. That's who Jesus sees even when they see someone else, when they see people who are other tax collectors, sinners, Jesus sees someone totally different. What he sees is family members. That's how Jesus sees them. He sees them as sons and daughters. He doesn't just see their sin. What he sees is a son. He doesn't just see a hooker or a harlot. What he sees as a daughter who is hurting. And I love what St. Augustus says, is that Jesus loves each, as a, each of us as if there is only one of us. So my question for you is, who is your one? If Jesus sees people one at a time, and he wants us to see people one at a time, who is your one? Do you see people one at a time like Jesus does? 
It reminds me of this uh, TikTok, <laughs> this TikTok that I saw by, by Devin Rodriguez. Uh, he's a really popular uh, uh, content creator on TikTok. Uh, and what he does is he sits on the subway of New York City and as he rides the subway, he's a very gifted artist. Uh, what he does is he draws uh, people that he's sitting across from, uh, but they're unsuspecting. They have no idea. They're just on their phones or, or reading or doing whatever, and, and he draws them. Uh, and then he gives them the, the drawing at the end of it. Now, the first few videos he did, he wouldn't give the, the drawings away. He would just draw them, and they had a, a few views. But what really made him go viral is when he changed the videos, when he started giving the people the, the drawing of themselves, is because it had this other side to it, this emotional response to it. Because David, the TikToker, was seeing people one at a time. And there was this one particular video that really stood out to me. It has several million views, uh, but he drew this woman sitting on, on the subway and she was moved to tears. And what she said really stood out to me. She said, with 10 million people in this city, it just feels so good to be seen. Now you might be sitting at home feeling like no one knows. No one knows what you have going on. No one knows what you're going through. But what I want you to know is that Jesus sees you. Jesus loves you. And Jesus is here for you. You have a church community who is here for you. A church community who loves you. Jesus sees you. It reminds me of my, my friend Lisa. Lisa. She told me the very reason that she continued coming to church is because on her very first time ever visiting, she was unsure about if this was going to be the kind of place for her. But on her way out, someone ha said, hey, I I've never met you before. Can you tell me, tell me your name? Are, are you new here? And the fact that someone went out of their way to just know her name made all the difference for her. Jesus sees people one at a time, and he wants us to do the same. Jesus sees those that are lost and far away, and so should we. That leads me to the next part. Uh, the next few verses, he shifts gears a little bit, uh, he, and he starts telling this parable. And what I want you to see is that Jesus saves people one at a time. Now, now I know theologically that that's not actually correct. I know that Jesus died once for all, and, and when he died on the cross, he died for all of our sins. But Jesus tells this parable uh, of these lost sheep, and obviously we're not sheep, but in, in the parable, it's meant to illustrate this idea that Jesus is willing to pursue us. Jesus is willing to go after us one at a time. And he tells this story uh, to get their attention. Uh, and what I love about that is because, is you know, when we hear a hundred sheep, we think, oh, that's, that's a lot of sheep. Uh, but I, I want you to know that a, a lot of sheep to uh, a person back then would be like 20 or 30 sheep. And so when Jesus tells, uh, tells this story and he says that there's a hundred sheep, this would immediately get their attention. It's like my... <laughs> My friend Josh, uh, he is a, a perpetually bad storyteller, and his wife always gets on him like, come on, pick it up, like, get to the end, get to the part, get to the part you're trying, and so I always tell him, I always tell him, if, if you ever feel like your stories are dragging, just, just add an explosion, or add a snake, or something. <laughs> add something that's going to get someone's attention, and that's kind of what Jesus does in a lot of his parables, is he tells these, these stories that people would be familiar with, these concepts like having sheep, but then he does it in a way that would grab their attention. So a, a, a shepherd that has a hundred sheep, well, that's a lot of sheep by ancient standards. But here's the thing. Even with a hundred sheep, each individual sheep is valuable. And it reminds me of this, this principle. Uh, uh, the, the fact that we value the things that belong to us. Now, while you and I might not be sheep or, or shepherds and, and we might not have ever even seen a sheep in real life, uh, I, I want you to know that you've probably experienced this. Uh, it, it's called the frequency 
illusion. It's also known as the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon. It's, if you've ever experienced this, like for example, I have a blue Camry. Uh, that's the kind of car I drive, right? Uh, now, I'm not a car person, uh, and I don't even think I ever heard of a, of a Camry before I started driving one, but as soon as I started driving one, I started noticing Camrys everywhere I went. It seemed like now there were hundreds of Camrys on the road everywhere I go, and, and I don't, you might not have a Toyota Camry. You might be driving a, a Jeep Liberty or a, a Chevy Malibu. I, I don't know what kind of car you drive, but you've probably had this experience, and maybe it's not with a car. Maybe it's with uh, something else, but... We've all had this experience where it's this thing that we, were, we thought we were unaware of, but as soon as it was ours, as soon as it, was, as it was valuable to us, then we started noticing it everywhere else. This is exactly what Jesus is saying, is even though the, the, in this parable there are many sheep, each one has value. The other thing I want you to know about sheep that's pretty interesting is that sheep, when they wander, uh, they don't do so intentionally. They don't do so maliciously. And I think that's a, a big misconception is sometimes we as followers of Jesus, we don't intentionally walk away. We don't intentionally drift away. But what happens is we just drift. Now sheep usually drift uh, or wander for one of two reasons, right? Either one, because they're blindly grazing, this is not an act of rebellion. They're just eating the piece of grass that's in front of them, and then they move on to the next one, and the next one, and before you know it, they're separate from the rest of the herd, and they're further from the rest of the herd, and then they look back, and they can't even see the rest of the herd. It's not necessarily an intentional act of rebellion, but it's a, a slow drift. A lot of us, I've had the same experience. Maybe we stopped going to church over COVID or, or because our, our son or daughter was in soccer or football or baseball or something and then we just got out of the habit. It's not because something happened. We just started drifting, right? It's not an intentional act of rebellion. The other reason that sheep wander is because they end up blindly following another sheep. They just follow the, the sheep that's right in front of them, and they assume that the sheep in front of them is leading them in the right direction, leading them in the right way. This is why it's so important to make sure you're paying attention to the right voices, because if you're not careful, the wrong sheep could lead you right off a cliff. I mean, I mean that literally. <laughs> I was reading this story from uh, Turkey, uh, and it said that there was one sheep jumped off to its death, which stunned the Turkish shepherds who had left their herd to graze while they had breakfast. But then they watched as nearly 1,500 other sheep followed, each leaping off the same exact cliff. Now, that is horrible. But in the end, there were only 450 dead animals as they lay on top of one another in a pillowy white pile. But you might be like, wait a minute, I thought you said there was 1,500. Well, yeah, eventually they all started landing on top of each other. And after the first 400 or so passed, all the other ones were landing on soft cushions. And they survived because they landed on the other dead sheep. They blindly followed off the cliff. How many of us have blindly followed someone else down a dangerous path? How many of us have just continued to blindly follow our significant other, our boyfriend or girlfriend or our supposed best friend or our work friend uh, and we continue to make foolish decision after foolish decision? What I'm reminded of when I read this story is that we are not the, sh the shepherd in the story. We are the sheep. We are the foolish ones who go astray. And some of us ha have gone astray unintentionally. 
because we've been just drifting away and some of us have been blindly following the wrong people. But what I want you to know is that Jesus sees you and he's searching for you and he wants nothing more than for you to come back home. And so many times we wanna, we wanna see ourselves as the hero of the story, but we are not the shepherd in the story. We are the sheep and Jesus is pursuing us. Jesus is pursuing you. Jesus loves you. He went to the cross for you and he wants you to come back home. That leads me to the, the third thing that I see when I look at this parable. When I'm looking at the, the last couple verses, verses five through seven, uh, I, I see this point that Jesus celebrates people one at a time. Jesus sees you and Jesus celebrates you we're called to celebrate people one at a time by zooming in on the one. The thing I love about this story is I can resonate with this. Because when the, the sheep come back home, they don't come back home to shame. They don't come back home to shame and, and, and they, are, they aren't reprimanded. They aren't shoved in a, pin, uh, in a pen in the corner. They aren't put off in, in a dark corner to, to be corrected, to, to get their life in order. No, instead, they come back to joy. They come back to celebration. And I want you to know, whether you've been gone for a day or for a hundred days, it doesn't matter how far you've gone or what kind of sins you've committed, you are not coming back to shame. What you're coming back to is celebration. It says in the text, And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors. He calls them together and says, rejoice with me. He throws a party. This isn't just like, oh, hey, this is a good thing. No, no, no. He calls everyone he knows, his friends, his neighbors, his coworkers, and he throws a party. He throws a celebration. This is good news. You're not coming back to shame you're coming back to a celebration. I love this. It's one of the reasons that I love getting to have the baptism talk with people. I love that as a pastor I get to talk with people and, and as they make their, their next steps and as they take those next steps to giving their life to Christ and one of the best things as I've moved back to my hometown, I, I grew up in Joliet uh, and I, I left for, for several years and then I came back as a pastor at Crossroads. But one of the best things is getting to baptize people that I know, people that I love. I've got to baptize my father-in-law and my mother-in-law and my aunt and uncles, and I've got to, to, to baptize nieces. And just a couple weeks ago, I got to baptize my brother-in-law. Uh, I, have, I have a picture of him, and I know he, he doesn't... You don't know him and he, it might not mean anything to you, but I love this picture because this is someone that my sister prayed for. This is someone that I prayed for. This is someone that his mother and his grandmother had prayed for for months and months and months. And I also love because uh, a bunch of people decided that they were gonna shoot off a bunch of confetti. Now our janitor, our, the person who oversees our building, he hated this, but I loved it. I loved it because I thought, what a beautiful picture of celebration. This this is exactly what happens when you decide to repent. This is exactly what happens when just one person decides to repent. There is a celebration in heaven and he calls us to do the same. Jesus celebrates those who are lost and far away and so should we. But the only way that we can do that is if we slow down long enough and zoom in close enough to see people the way that Jesus did and the way that Jesus saw people was one at a time. Which reminds me, it reminds me of, of this, this social experiment 
Uh, and, and maybe you've seen this social experiment in the past, uh, and, and you might be familiar with it, but it, it, it was basically asking people to count the number of times a basketball is passed back and forth. Uh, it's like a 15-second clip, and there's a handful of people. There's three people in white T-shirts, and then there's three people in black T-shirts, and it says, count the number of times the people in the white basketball shirts pass the ball. And now there's several people, and there's several balls being tossed back and forth, uh, but you know, you're focused in on this 10 second clip uh, and you're counting the passes, right? And then at the end, it asks the question, how, how, many, how many passes were there? And so of course, I, the answer I think is like 15 or something. Uh, and then there's another question and it says, did you see the gorilla? Uh, and it, I, maybe you've seen this video or not, but you can watch it. You can look it up online. Uh, but I'm like, wait a minute, what gorilla? There's no way that a gorilla, and then it goes, it rewinds the tape, and sure enough, uh, it wasn't an actual gorilla. It was just a guy in a gorilla costume. A guy in a gorilla costume saunters right out in the middle of all the people passing the basketballs, but you're so focused on counting the basketballs that you totally miss the gorilla right in front of you. Because you're looking at and you're looking for the wrong thing. Don't get so busy doing things for Jesus that we miss the people that Jesus puts right in front of us, the people that he wants us to see, the people that he wants us to celebrate, the people that he wants to connect with one at a time. It's real easy to focus on the wrong thing. But my hope is that we would see people just like Jesus did, one at a time. And that reminds me of this last verse I want to leave leave you with. This was actually our our theme verse for our 21 days of of prayer and fasting. Uh, It comes from Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 through 38. It says this, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now we just read that parable about how a a shepherd cares for a sheep. He says, like a sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Church, this is my prayer for us as we lead up to Easter, that he would send us out into the harvest field and we would see people the same way that Jesus did. We would see people one at a time and when they repent and when they return home, we would celebrate with them the same way that Jesus does. And so here's our our takeaway. And here's my challenge for you. And, and each week, uh, we, we focus on uh, one of or a couple of the, the markers of a healthy disciple. Now, here at Westbrook and at Crossroads, one of the things we talk about a lot is the four markers of a healthy disciple. The four markers of a healthy disciple are worship, practices, connection, and action. And so the two things that we're going to focus on today comes from practices and connection. And so what I want you to do is I want you to set your alarm for 815. This comes with our practices. Now, it doesn't have to be 815. That's when I choose to do mine. Every morning at 815, my alarm goes off and it reminds me to pray. And the reason I have it set for 815 is the area code in Joliet, my hometown, is 815. Now, I know a lot of you might have the same area code, or you might be a 630 area code, and uh, so I want to challenge you. It doesn't have to be 815. It could be, it could be 630. It could be you know, what, whatever you need it to be, but set your alarm for a time that you're going to remember. I have it set for 815 because that is my area code, and it reminds me to pray for someone in my town, in my area code. And so part of the practices is during your daily time with God, I want you to, to pray for someone. I want you to pray for the one. I want, I want you to pray for opportunities to connect with them, to share the gospel with them, to invite them to church with you. 
as we get ready for Easter, this is a great opportunity to invite your friends, your family, your coworkers. And so this week, as we see people the way that Jesus does, one at a time, I wanna challenge you to set your alarm clock for 8.15 and pray for someone each and every day. Pray for an opportunity to see them the way that Jesus does. Pray for an opportunity to share with them the love that Jesus has for them. Church, this is my prayer for you, and this is my prayer for us. Let me pray. God, I want to say thank you for today. Thank you for another opportunity to be reminded of the way that you see us, the way that you seek us, and the way that you celebrate when we repent. God, thank you for this good news. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God, we bless your name today. We believe that you are making a way in our lives, even in the places where we don't see it or feel it. We love you today, God. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
with all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you.